Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday night. Um, get in and find Jesus in the Old Testament. Um, glad everybody is here tonight. And hopefully, adjust my light here a little bit. Turn that light out maybe a little bit. There we go. Um, we will uh, get into the word here. It's going to be good tonight. We want to pray as well for all the things that are happening around our counties. Um, I mean, my goodness, all kinds of things happening. But there is hope that everything opens up May 1st. Let's keep believing God for that. Amen. The um, We've got a good word tonight and, and a good study, and, and I want you to kind of dig into it. Uh, we're going to be starting off in like Genesis about 36, I think, or 37. Um, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. And I want to tell you before we do, Friday night, I'll be sending out an email tomorrow, uh, Friday night at seven o'clock uh, in the evening. We're going to have a time of communion and in a time of prayer. Now, it's not going to last real long, maybe 15 minutes. And, and we're just going to have communion and we're going to pray. We're going to pray over for deliverance. We're going to pray for protection. We're going to pray because it's Good Friday and we need to be as a nation once again, worshiping together in, in public houses of worship. And, and so we're going to pray and we'd like for everybody to join us, pass the word along. We're going to have a good time to um, have our Seder with the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you, first of all, for all the answered prayers, Lord God, for Mindy's neighbor that we prayed for. Father, for uh, Christina Cup's dad, Bill Mentz. Father, we prayed for him. He's out of the hospital. Mindy's neighbor's out of the hospital. Father, all kinds of good things are happening. Brother Chuck is healed up and uh, walking and talking and moving his arm, Lord God, when he was told he wasn't. Father, you are the Lord of lords and King of kings. You are the our God, our healer. We thank you for it. We thank you, Father, for being with us tonight, for teaching us tonight, for give, opening up your word, giving us revelation and hope in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father, for all the people who are joining us tonight. Father, open up minds, open up hearts, open up eyes, and, and give us revelation of how deeply you love us, how deeply you care for us and protect us. And we just praise for you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be looking here. First of all, thank you, everybody. A good group on tonight, and I expect that we're going to get it deep into the word and, and hear some good stuff. Genesis chapter 35. I said 36, chapter 35, verse number one. And we're talking about Jacob. Then God, it's Elohim in this particular passage. Then God, Elohim, said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel, which means the house of God. And dwell there and make an altar there to God, El, not Elohim again, El, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. Now, here we see the plural name for God in the Old Testament speaking with Jacob. This means that all the Godhead spoke to Jacob. This, this is talking about the same God that was in the book of Genesis. You know, in the beginning, God created God. Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And God, Elohim, said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. It's an it's a old Hebrew name, plural name for God, meaning God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's, it's the plurality of the Godhead. Now, El is specifically because Jacob is told to make an altar to God, El. El was used very infrequently in the Old Testament. And this is the name, the shortened Old Testament name for God, the Almighty. Speaking of God, God, the, the, if you want to look at it as the totality of the Godhead, or if you want to look at it as the, the one who sits on the throne that Isaiah saw high and lifted up, whose train filled the temple and his glory shone all around. So, but it is talking about God, the Almighty. The Hebrews understood that as the God of creation. The God that created everything that there was to create. So here, Elohim, God the Father, God the Son, the God the Holy Ghost, the same God that was in the in the midst of creation, speaks to Jacob 
and tells him, arise, go to the house of God. Remember, it's that place where he had met God on his way to Laban and to, uh, to hide from Esau. And he had erected an altar then. His countenance, his thought processes, his, uh, his understanding of God was completely different at that point in time. Re remember, this is when Jacob says, hey, you show me that you'll be faithful to me and I'll make you my God. You show me you're going to do everything you promise and I'll make you my God. Now, he may have been looking forward, hoping that all that happened. He may, may maybe he was being testing of God. Either direction, no matter how you look at it, Jacob had an insight of how to talk to God. Now, I believe he learned that from Isaac because Isaac would talk to God and say, you're the God of uh, my father, Abraham. You promised us. And, and then he would speak about it. And, and here we see Jacob picking up in the same spot. Now, this is clearly 100% speaking of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of creation, the Almighty. Now look at 35, 2 through 3. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him. Now understand where we go here. This is Jacob that just left his... Uh, his father-in-law Laban's place. He's got his two wives with him, all of his children, his 12 sons, his daughter. He, he's traveling along. His daughter, uh, Rachel, he, she hid the um, the gods of, of her dad, Laban, hit him, sat on him, said she was on her customary time of impurity so that he, she wouldn't have to get up. And, and they passed by. Jacob, after having this conversation where God says, pick it up, buddy, Go to Bethel, and I'll meet you there. He comes out to all of his household, and he says, put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves, change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. Jacob makes this profound move right here to honor God alone as his God. This is where he he grabs hold of it. See that? He grabs hold of it. This is really a, a great picture of how it ought to be in salvation. Get rid of all the other gods. Drop all the other things you've been worshiping. All the things that are there. Purify yourself. Change your garments. You're a new creation in Christ. That's the picture we're seeing here of Jacob. Then let us arise and go up to the house of God. Man, let's go to church, right? There, he says, I'm going to make an altar to God. Because this God answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way in which I've gone. Remember what he asked God. Remember what he said to God. Listen, you show yourself strong. You show yourself for all these promises you said you're going to make, and I'll, I'll make you my God forever. Didn't he say that? You think God would say, hey, well, you, you better believe me first. Here, here's, here's the faith message, right? Here, here's the big powerhouse religious message. Well, listen, you better straighten up your act first. You, you, better, you better prove to God. You better prove to God that you're worthy. To come to him. You better clean your whole act up. You better get your head together. You better study. You can't go up to the house of God and go making some kind of altar up there and and, and um and, and unless you you know straighten yourself up, right? And uh that that's the way religion thinks. Look at the way God thinks. He shows up to him, hey. It's almost like God could have said this. Hey, how'd I do, Jacob? Remember Laban? Remember all that? Now let me tell you how you can take care of Esau. And, and he, he tells him, go up. Go up to the house of God. It's Jacob then that decides, listen, I know who God is. He's El. 
He, he is the God of creation. He is the God that's formed everything. He is the God that I'm going to serve. Goes out and tells all of his family. We're going to, we're going to put away all these other gods. Everything else that has taken the place, taken up my time, taken up my heart, taken up my thought processes, all of the things that I've worshipped, all the things I've given honor to, tribute to, money to, all of those things, we're putting them away. And then we're going to change our garments. We're not, we're not going to run around like this anymore. And, and we're going up to the house of Bethel, the house of God. Profound how he comes out of this. They have been traveling with all kinds of idols. But now Jacob makes the decision that there's going to be one God. One God. You know, there's only three religions in the entire world who say that there was one God. Christianity, we say there's one God. Judaism says there's one God. Islam says there's one God. The only three religions, all of them can be traced back to Abraham. It's amazing, amazing fact. Other religions, they'll laugh and they'll say, you got your, you got your one God. Is he able to do everything? Is he able to do all this stuff? This this one God, we've got two million. We've got, you know, Japanese have have several million gods. The, the uh, Indians have several million gods. The Hindus we're talking about several million gods. And here they come out and they say, Jacob says, we got one. Let's take a look at Genesis 35, four. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands. Now listen to this, and the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree, which is by Shechem. Now they begin their journey by stripping away all the gods they had been taking with them. This is what ought to happen in every Christian's life. We ought to just get rid of them. Now here's an interesting thing, earrings. Now I'm not against let me just give a disclaimer right off the bat. I am not against ladies wearing earrings. Guys, if you feel so moved, okay. Here, here's what is interesting about this. In this day and age, an earring was worn as a sign to whom you were loyal to or devoted to or who was your master. If, if a slave was in a house, and he served out his time, paid off whatever debt it was he had or whatever he had to do. He, he would earn his freedom. The master would then release him and his children and his wife. They would release them. They, they were no longer in servitude to him. Now, the servant, if he found that master to be true, to be somebody worth his loyalty, he would go and he would run in awe through his ear. A, a thing to drill a hole. He would run it through his ear, and then he would put a an earring for that master into his ear, so that everybody could see he belonged to that house. Jacob has all of these people, and he doesn't actually tell them that. He just tells them to take off or to get rid of the gods that are with them. They come out and they take out all the earrings of who they had been loyal to. Which are probably representative of, you know, the sun god, the moon god, the this god and that god. They bring them to Jacob and they say, we're not, we're not loyal to these anymore. Man, what a picture. What a picture for the, for the people of God. Get rid of that stuff. Genesis 35 and 5. And they journeyed. Listen to this now. And they journeyed and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. The terror of God. Now, all these places have all these gods, right? They, they have gods they fear. Uh, you, if you read the, in, in Kings about Balaam, or Balak, I'm sorry, uh, and, and the god Baal, they bring him out, they've got a a wooden thing of stump of Baal, right? And they, they sit it up. They bring the Ark of the Covenant. They sit it before the, the uh, stump of Baal. And the thing keeps falling over. 
and eventually it falls over and breaks. All these nations have all these gods, but only Israel, at this point in time, only Israel, only the people of Jacob have one God. And it says, and the terror of God was upon the cities as they go around them. Now, this word terror is the, the Hebrew word shitta. It's C-H-I-T-T-A. Shitta. It's chet tav he. The chet means outside of the wall. And, uh, it's a picture of a wall. It's it's a it's the letter to your right in Hebrew, and and it's it's kind of a hook with a straight line. That's a picture of a wall. Now it means outside because if you're on this side of the wall, if you're in the inside of the wall, the other side would be outside. Um, it it is also uh, what is un, unseen, unknown would be on the other side because you can't see through the wall. There's not a window in the wall. It, so whatever's on the other side, it's outside. It's unknown. The middle letter, the Tav, is mark, sign, or a cross. The, the very original Tav actually looked like St. Andrew's cross. You know, it was, it was kind of an X um, and it was kind of tilted. Well, it was a cross. Isn't it interesting that we find the Tav is also found when we're talking about Jesus being nailed to the tree? The Tav. So we have a wall. Behind the wall is a tree or a, a Tav, a, a cross. On the other side of the cross is revelation or grace, a hay. So when they're talking about the terror, of God, what they're talking about is the other nations couldn't see what was behind the wall. They could only see the God of Israel, that this one that struck terror in their heart. Jacob and his group wasn't seeing God that struck terror in their heart. They were seeing on the other side of the wall. They were seeing on the outside of the wall. They were seeing that there, there was a mark or a sign that gave them grace gave them favor, gave them revelation of who that God is. This is why when, when we say the terror of God was upon all the cities, listen, terror strikes in the heart of those who don't understand God. Here we see a perfect picture of what happens at the cross. As terrible as the cross was, as, as horrifying as it was, it, as much terror as it strikes in the heart of men today even, as they look at that and people just, oh, they, I just can't look upon it. And, and people will fear God. Listen, they'll fear God. Jacob wasn't fearing God. Jacob was going up to the house of God. And the reason why he was going up to the house of God is because he knew on the other side was the sign of favor. He knew on the other side of that wall was the sign of favor for the, for his enemies, for those who would have something against him. They saw him and they were they were terrified. We need to understand as believers, we we can follow this pattern of God. We saw it in Abimelech. We saw it in the uh, the Pharaoh of of, um, of Egypt that would have taken uh, Sarah. At the time, Sarai it is it, into his harem. God showed himself, and, and the guy struck was struck with terror. Because to look at God, it's a, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. To look at God without understanding the grace, without being able to see on the other side, without being able to look through that window and see with revelation the God of grace. It's terrifying. Yeah, good point. Good point, Jackie. Jackie says, and Steve, they, they say God's grace covered Jacob even when his sin had made him vulnerable. Exactly. And, and for us to understand that as believers. Listen, I've, I've seen all kinds of nonsensical statements about the coronavirus. On, on both sides of the fence. From, from Christians who were way out there going to tempt God and tempt with evil to 
people who were completely terrified and said that God did all this and he's doing it all and he's doing it all to pay us back for, you know, America back for abortion and Europe back for this and that and the other thing. I mean, it's it's amazing how people see God when they ought to be looking through and seeing the cross and grace. Now, Genesis 35, 9 through 12, then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Paddan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he named his name Israel. Israel means the strength of God or the power of God or the commander of God. Also, God said to him, I am God Almighty. He reveals himself. Listen, I am God Almighty. I am the God of creation. I am the God that holds everything in place. I am, I am that being that created all of this stuff. There is no God besides me. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I give to you, and your descendants after you, I give this land. Now, this is Jesus, once again, coming to Jacob, reaffirming the promise. Jacob now is, is falling into fold with, with his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac, and, and he's having this revelation of who this God is that would so favor him that in the midst of his of his sin, just because of the promise that he made, that God made to his uh, grandfather, Abraham, just because of that promise, God would show the same favor to him because he's in the bloodline of Abraham and for no other reason. Man, we can learn something from that by if we grab a hold of that to understand that we have favor because we are in the bloodline of Christ. Bought by the blood. He redeemed us, the word says, with his own blood, redeemed us, bought us back. And it says he's made us heirs and sons and daughters. Now, we have to grab hold of an understanding of how big God is, but not like the nations that saw him and saw terror. We have to get an understanding of how big God is as the nation that saw him and saw grace. That's why I said there's so much grace in the Old Testament. When we get through here, I mean, it, it'll, it'll give you something to work on, you know. Now, Joseph is, was Israel's favorite. It was, he was, Joseph was by far Israel's favored son. And he becomes a type of Christ. When his brothers sell him off and carry a tale of him being devoured by an animal back to his father. Because right after this whole thing with, with Jacob, he, he gets through the, the whole mess with Esau and he, and he has this great family. Only there's problems in the family. Got 12 sons. Got one son, Joseph, who, I mean, he's really gotten a hold of, you know, that there's a God in heaven. He's he's really gotten a hold of it. His father worships his God in that. But he's having dreams. And in his youth of having dreams, he goes and he tells the dreams to his brothers. Well, he's the second youngest, and he's telling dreams to his brothers that say that he's going to dominate over them and rule over them and even rule over his father and mother. Uh, there's a little bit of a problem in the family line with that. So they take Joseph, who Israel just favors. He, he's, he's got him down. It's his favorite. And they take him out and they want to get rid of him, this dreamer. So they take him, they, they dump him in a pit. They take the uh, coat of many colors. You all know that story that Jacob had made for him. They take it and they cover it in blood, animal's blood. They take it back, Joseph, your son's dad. Uh, an animal devoured him in the wilderness. We tried to save him, but, you know, all we could get was this coat. Jacob gets then sold off. Uh, first to the Ishmaelites, they drop him off to the Midianites, and, and then finally he ends up 
in Egypt being bought uh, by a guy by the name of uh, Potiphar. He becomes a slave in Potiphar's house. He's the type of Christ in that he gets sold off by his brothers. Jesus was portrayed by his brothers, the Hebrew people. He's left for dead. And they say, um, let his blood be upon us. As Joseph's brothers took the blame in front of, of Israel, their dad. They came back and said, Dad, it's our fault. We couldn't save him. We couldn't rescue him. Let his blood be upon us. What did the nation of Israel say when they say, crucify him, crucify him? Let his blood be upon us and upon our children. Man, what a terrible thing. What a terrible thing to speak over your children. Let his blood be upon us and upon our children. So we begin into the story of Joseph, and we're going to see some things with Joseph, how he is by I mean, he's in a lot of ways a type of Christ through this whole thing. But his relationship with the Lord is is really an interesting one because he's raised up in Pharaoh's house. He's raised up basically from being this young guy in Potiphar's house. He gets taken over to Pharaoh that becomes a servant there. He's raised up. He's taught all the things. He becomes a great slave. Uh, and then they write him out. Well, pardon me. In Potiphar's house, he becomes a great uh, slave and um, is ministering to them as a Hebrew slave would. And with all the information and all that, that a Hebrew would have, Potiphar was very high up, just not too far below Pharaoh himself. Potiphar's got this guy running around. He's got a lot of favor with him because he's blessed. Take a look at 39, 2 through 4. The Lord was with Joseph. And he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had, he put under his authority. Now, it's evident to all who contact Joseph that he is favored with almighty God. They, they don't. Understand, because the Egyptians at this time have um, it's dozens of gods, uh, all the um, Egyptian gods, Ra, the sun god and and all these other ones that they had. And, and all the past pharaohs became gods. Um, they're not believers in Yahweh, but they know of him and fear him as the God of creation. They know that there is is a God over everything. They see that Joseph has this supernatural uh, anointing on him. He, he just has a supernatural uh, favor over his life. And everything he touches is blessed. And so in the middle of all this favor, um, maybe a little too much favor, he, he's kind of a handsome dude. Potiphar's wife, she thinks he's attractive. She goes after him. When she goes after him, the um, they they kind of get in an altercation because he turns her down. She continues to pursue him. He comes to her one day. Yeah, he did. He rebuked her. Um, and she comes on to him again. He says, I'm not going to do it. I will not betray. I, and he says, I'm not going to sin against God. I'm not going to sin against my God. I won't do it. So she grabs his cloak, rips his clothes off of him. And in other words, he goes running away. Her husband comes back, Potiphar. What's going on? She's having a sob fest. The guy who owns his cloak, he just tried to, to rape me. Oh, my gosh. She's, he's all mad. I can't believe Joseph did this. Throws him in prison. 39, 5 through 6. So it was. From the time that he had made himself overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hands, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. This is a magnificent lesson for us believers. Unbelievers will favor us when God favors us. When, it, when is it that God favors us? How about all the time? What if we don't know it, though? 
What if we don't believe it? What if we don't believe that God favors us? I'm telling you, the first several years of our Christianity, um, we got saved 1981, uh, Betty and I. And in the middle of that, we knew a lot of things. We knew we were blessed. We knew that God loved us. We knew all that. But, but we didn't have an understanding that God favored us. With favor comes blessing. What if you don't know that God favors you? What if you don't know the promises of God about peace and joy? What if you don't know the promises of God about prosperity? What if you don't know the promises of, of God of, about having favor with God and men? What if you don't know the promises of God when it comes to um, whatever your hands touch will prosper, wherever your feet tread? Yeah, you can be deceived. Not only can you be deceived, but you won't understand how to tap into it. If you don't know it's there, how do you know to ask? How do you know to grab hold of it? How do you know when to pursue it? How do you know to even look for it if you don't know it's there? Listen, Joseph clearly understands there's something special in his life. He saw it in his father's house. He had a hard time understanding why everybody didn't like his dreams. Sometimes people need to mature a little bit. You know what I mean? In their Christian Christianity. I mean, I've seen people take off with some wild things because they were new. Nobody really understood. They didn't understand the gifts and talents and abilities that they had. Uh, and and so you get out in front of yourself a little bit. And, and it happens. And that's where Joseph was as a young man. But then now, now he's in a position where he's got all this favor and he's probably, you know, moving along a little bit. And, you know, he's he's got some authority, some power. We ha we have got to stop believing that we don't have influence in this world or on this world. We've got to stop believing that we've got to stop believing that we we just going to lay down and take it as it comes. And, and that we don't have any influence over people around us, over our jobs, over, you know, I, I've heard people say, well, I don't know what to do. I just, you know, m my boss is this way. My boss is that way. How about understanding that you are the Ark of the Covenant in that place because Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Start doing your job better than anybody else does their job. Start being kinder, more compassionate to everybody. Start speaking over your boss when everybody else is saying what a, a horse's batutie is. Start speaking over him favor. Start speaking over him blessing. And find out what happens. Find out what happens to your life. Find out what happens on your job. How about your neighborhood? How about the people around you? We have been so busy in Christianity, judging the world and making enemies of, of, of our life, that we forgot how to be what Jesus told us to be. He told Abraham, in blessing, I will bless you. In blessing, I will bless you. He said, I'm going to make you a blessing to the entire world. If we are the heirs, according to the blessing of Abraham, then we are the blessing to the entire world. Take a look here, Luke 2, 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Jesus had favor with both fa his father and men. Not just, not just God the father, he had favor with men. Well, I don't see that. I mean, they crucified Jesus, right? Jesus is going along and he tells his disciples. This is before the um, before they go for their Seder meal on um, at Passover. And he says, go in the town. When you find a, a cult tied up, go to that house. There'll be a, an upper room there. Go to them and tell them that. I have use of that room. Now, it doesn't say they know this guy. It doesn't say he's an acquaintance. He's somebody, you know, a follower of Jesus. It doesn't say any of that. It leaves all that out. So we have to believe this is just somebody 
The disciples go. They weren't familiar with the guy because otherwise, why didn't Jesus say, hey, go to Frank's house? You know, we're going to meet at Frank's house. We'll see you there. We'll have our Seder meal in his big room he's got upstairs. He didn't say any of that. He, he says, go and tell the, the guy that, I, that we have needed this room. So they go. They have their meal there. No questions asked. Jesus has favor with people all over the place. He gets invited. Look at the, all the parties Jesus went to. I mean, we find Jesus. He's being invited to tax collectors' houses. He's being invited to, to rulers' houses, to people who are head over different parts of the government. He gets invited to all these things. So much so that the Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious folks, are jealous of him. The other people aren't jealous of him. The other people are trying to reach him so much so that they're tearing roofs off of houses so they can lower their sick down to him. He has favor with all the people. We just celebrated Palm Sunday. Jesus rides into town. And people treat him like he's the coming Messiah. He has favor with the whole crowd. It's, I'm, I'm telling you, it's an amazing thing when God's hand of favor is on the believer. But we need to believe it. And I'm not going to tell you that, I, oh, hey, I've got a hold of this, you know, two days after I got saved and I believe this all my life. I haven't. I haven't walked in it all my life. I've missed a lot of times not understanding what God had really given me. But I'm finding out and the scriptures are opening up more and more. And I see we as believers, we have a lot more going for us than what we dare to believe. And we've got to understand that. Take a look at 1 John 4, 17. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. This is not talking about the great day of judgment. This is talking about the day of judgment for us. Because as he is, so are we in this world. As Jesus had favor with men, so will we have favor with men. It sure seems like a lot of believers try not to be liked by unbelievers. It really does. Listen, we ought to, we ought to be the most liked people. Not because we're pandering to people. None of that. Because our li lives are so full of love and grace. And because we have a, a different way of, of handling things than the world does. And, and I know, listen, times are tough. We get we get in tough situations. We can't all, always hold it together. And, and we think, man, I'd like to, you know, flatten this guy or I'd like to do this or do that. Or uh, we we just shouldn't go there because we've got to remember who we are. We're children of the king. Take a look here at First Samuel 226. And the child Samuel. Probably the most famous of, of the prophets, he, he and Elijah, I would say. And the child Samuel grew in stature and in favor, both with the Lord and with men. I noticed a pattern here with God. I've seen it with Joseph, saw it with Abraham, saw it with Isaac. We, we saw it with Samuel. We, see, we saw it with David, saw it with Solomon. I mean, Solomon had people coming from faraway kingdoms, from the east, from, from down in the, the, the lower section of Africa, uh, from up in, in uh, what would be uh, modern-day Turkey. Kings bringing uh, silver, gold, timbers to him. See, he want, needed cedar to, to build this magnificent uh, temple he was building. And, and they brought him cedar for free. I mean, loads and loads of it. Silver and, and gold so much that he he didn't have anything to do with the silver anymore. It, they were just piling it up and like it was a junk heap. Like we pile up old cars today in a in a in a lot, you know. There, he had so much favor, and then we see Jesus having favor with God and man. Even Paul the apostle, while he was imprisoned by the primarily by the Jewish people. Um, because they kept calling the Roman government on him because he was causing problems. But they, every time he'd go to prison, they loved him. 
All of his captors loved him. They, they, uh, there are many accounts that say that they didn't want to put him to death. They didn't want to put him to death. They didn't want to end his life. He was healing people that were his captors. He was healing their children. He was doing all kinds of magnificent things. And, and people were being blessed by Paul. Along with the favor of God. I, I need for you to understand this and really grab hold of this tonight. Along with the favor of God comes favor with men. Get that? Along with the favor of God comes favor with men. If we would believe it, all things are possible to those who believe. It is an unusual for God to bring us into favor with men. He uses those we come in contact with to bless us, and he uses us to bless them. Take a look at Luke 6, 37 and 38. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Man, I I got a new revelation on this, on this verse. Um, this verse is really a, 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 a pattern or a, a, a plan laid out for us. Do not judge and you won't be judged. Don't condemn and you won't be condemned. Think about that. I mean, I struggle with some of, some of these things. And, and I know a lot of other people do, too. There, there are times, you know, your, your, your halo comes down and starts choking you out because you're in a tense situation or you see something that just isn't right. And you, you're tempted to think, ah, you know, them, those people. Yeah, those people. Right. Don't condemn. You won't be condemned. Don't judge and you won't be judged. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Man, there's a tough one. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. Well, yeah, well, what if they were at fault? Doesn't make any difference. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you in good measure. Press down and overflowing. Get this. Press down and overflowing. They shall cast into your lap. The original Aramaic language. I know uh, King James says, press down, shaken together, and running over. Shall men give into your bosom. Well, the original Aramaic, I think, lays it out a pretty clear picture for us. They shall cast into your lap. And with what measure you measure it will be measured to you. Now, I used to always think, well, you know, if you gave them a nickel and you should have given them a quarter, you gave them a dollar, you should have given them five dollars. You know, that was the measure. It, that's not what this is talking about. But with what measure you measure it, it's talking about all the above. All of the above, the don't judge, the don't condemn, the forgive, and the give. What measure you measure it, how, how you see it, what is your perception on what you're giving out? What is your perception on how you're judging? What's your perception on how you're condemning? What's your perception on how you forgive? What's your perception, perception on how you give? How do you measure it? For what measure you measure it will be measured to you. That's why we got to understand that with the favor of God comes the favor of men. Because if we begin to measure our life under the favor of God, the favor of God will be, me will be the measuring stick that men will measure it back to us. You guys, you guys get it? Are you grabbing a hold of that? Think about Joseph here. Joseph is a type of Christ in, in how much he had um, he'd given out to, to Potiphar. I mean, he blessed Potiphar. He did everything possible to be as honest, as loyal, as upright as he could possibly be to Potiphar. You say, well, yeah, he ended up in prison. I mean, that just, that just didn't fare. It didn't seem like it. Wait a minute now. We're not done with the story. You know, we're not we're not done with the whole story here. Well, you guys are being kind of quiet tonight. <laughs> um, 
the measure, if we'll begin to understand ourselves as under the measure of God's favor in everything, judgment, condemnation, forgiveness, and giving. Understand our life that way. Understand how that works and understand the measure coming back to us. I think about it. I Listen, I've messed up a lot of times because I've measured out in my measurement. Measured out forgiveness, my measurement. Measured out giving, my measurement. Measured out condemnation, my measurement. Judgment, my measurement. What if I measured out God's? What if that was the measuring stick? Man, I think a lot of missed opportunity. Let's go back to Joseph here. Genesis 39, 20 through 23. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, a place. Now, this is after he gets accused of rape, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in the prison. Now, he could have been taken to another prison. He could have been taken not to the king's prisoners. He could have been taken to the other everybody else's prison, which I'm sure was way worse. And he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him, once again, gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. He can't get away from this favor. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison, whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority. So here's Joseph. He's in prison, right? He's put in prison for a pretty bad crime. I mean, take one of the top dogs and you make a, you know, you try and attack his wife uh, sexually. And she screams and hollers and, you know, she grabs your clothes and uh, hangs on to him and you get to run away naked. That's a pretty severe charge, I think. And, and so here he is running off. He gets put into prison. But the keeper of the prison doesn't even check anything that Joseph is doing. That's how much favor he's got. You get in the picture about what I'm saying about God's favor on us. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. Not because Joseph was a stellar person, because the Lord was with him. That's why he was a stellar person, because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Man, think about us. Think about our lives, right? Take a look at Genesis 41, 14 through 16. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon, and he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. And the reason why he had to do all that is because uh, the Hebrew, I mean the uh, Egyptians, couldn't have anybody with facial hair on them. And they had to cut their hair and everything. Um, and, and they could not come in dirty. They they were they were germaphobes. Uh, really, they were real clean freaks. And and it, so here's Pharaoh. He's sitting in, you know, on his throne and, and they bring Joseph in because he's had some terrible dreams and nobody's able to answer his dreams. Now, Joseph has been in prison this whole time. He's been betrayed by the baker and uh, the king's cupbearer. And and he comes out, you know, they, he's told them um, their, what their dreams were. They were 100 percent accurate. Finally, the guy says, hey, there was this guy in prison who who uh, could interpret dreams. Nobody else can interpret dreams. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said that you can answer, that you can understand a dream to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. He's saying, it. listen, it, it isn't mine. This, the gift I have is not mine. It's God's. Man, what if he would have had that earlier? What if he'd have had that with his brothers? What if he'd have been able to talk this way with his dad when he told his dad that he would rise up and, and be over him? What, what if he had had all that understanding? Things may have been different. But he was young. He was immature. And, and that's why Paul says, don't put a novice in a position of authority, lest they be filled up with condemnation of the devil and fall the same way. 
of their own, you know, of their own big headedness. So here's Joseph. He's learned some lessons. Listen, it's not in me. God will give you an answer of peace. Here is God giving an answer of peace to Pharaoh. God is given all the credit by Joseph. 32 and 33. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Now, this is Joseph interpreting the dream of Pharaoh. This is an amazing uh, thing here for us to understand. I uh, mean, talk about a lesson where, where Jesus begins to move hearts of people. And God, God is working in this thing the whole time. God establishes himself as the authority on matters of men. Pharaoh recognizes the truth in what Joseph speaks regarding his dreams. God puts Joseph in position to be the head of all in order to preserve his people alive in the midst of the worst famine to ever hit the land. Understand this. God is moving, and Joseph gets this at the end when he tells his brothers, listen, guys, whatever you did to me, listen, I understand. It, it, it just had to happen so that this, this thing could happen, so you could pre be preserved alive. God set me up, and God set you up, and God, God is, had his hand in all of it. If we'll understand the circumstance around us, is God having his hand in it? You see how Joseph is learning? Really, he's learning all about this. It's the same thing that happened with Jesus when he went to the cross. I mean, Joseph doesn't go to the cross, obviously, but it, but it's the it's the same understanding that God is in control of it all. It's the same thing when Isaac was going up the side of the mountain and he's carrying all the you know he's thirty year old guy and he's carrying all the you know all the wood and everything for the sacrifice, but there's no sacrifices. So he asks his dad. Dad, I see we got the wood, we got the knife, uh, it kind of looks like we got the fire, we're ready for a sacrifice here, but there's no sacrifice, Dad. Uh, what's up with this? Just me and you here. Don't worry, son. The Lord will provide a ram for himself, a sacrifice for himself. God's in charge of it. It's the way it is, and Joseph understands that. God puts Joseph in the midst of everything, puts him in charge. Not only does he head it up, but it all prospers, and so does he. <laughs> this is, uh, you, you got to read this thing. Genesis 41, 38 through 42. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one? Is this a man in whom is the spirit of God? <laughs> Pharaoh saying, hey, uh, who? Joseph gave us a good idea. We need to find a guy who's full of God who understands his plan, because if there's anybody going to going to, you know, take care of us, it is going to be th this God over everything, the almighty one who's over all the gods of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there's no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. That is a huge deal. And he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He took Joseph and Joseph set himself up for this. Listen, folks, we don't in, in this present world, in, in what's going on out there, I and listen, I'm having my eyes open to a lot of this stuff it, as I go through our, our Christianity here. Um, God not only will give you the right things to say, the right things to do, but God will set you up with the things to say so that you end up taking the positions and being in the spot that he needs for you to be. And the people, the people that you're speaking to are going to look at you and say, wow, you're you're the you're the person. I know that we need this, this and this and this and this. You you clearly laid all that out, but you're it. Genesis 41 and 46, Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. 
Now, this is just an interesting side note to Joseph being a type of Christ. Jesus began to be about 30 years of age, says John, after being baptized by John in the Jordan. He began to be about 30 years of age. Joseph begins to be who he is supposed to be, the, the one who rescues Israel in, in a time of great famine. He begins to be about the same age that Jesus was. That man, that's that's an incredible, just a little tidbit. And Pharaoh, when he gives the signet ring to Joseph, puts it on his finger, puts the gold chains around his neck. He is essentially saying, this is my son. He's he's in the same spot as my son would be in. There's nobody, nobody higher than me, except or in, in your eyes. Nobody higher than him except for me. Think about that. Now, Joseph goes on. He he gets married when he's given um, the daughter of the priest of On. Yeah, he does. My dad says he keeps pr pressing the right buttons. Yeah, he does. He's given the daughter of the priest of On after all this to Joseph. All of that says this this guy is is like my son because the the priest of on that was the the highest god then that this particular pharaoh worshipped and so he had that priest there well if he's going to give him this priest daughter who apparently was a knockout if he's going to give her to to uh joseph it, it is because he's saying i'm picking just like my son now joseph then has two sons manasseh and ephraim Genesis 41, 50 and 52. And to Joseph were born two sons after the years of famine came, whose Ashenath, whom Ashenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, bore to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God had made me forget all my toil in all my father's house. And the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. God will cause you to be fruitful in the land of your affliction. If God bless Jesus, then God will bless you. It is his modus operandi. He's the, he has this pattern just to bless. Joseph's number one son, Manasseh, whose name means cause to forget, his number two son, literally it means double fruit. In Christ, we're given these offspring as well, that the, the things that are, that are fluent in our life. Number one, we forget. Everything is behind us. Our previous life, gone. Number two, we're double. We have double fruit. We don't just have fruit in our life. We have double fruit. Jesus said that we should bear fruit more abundant. That's the promise of our life of blessing. Take a look as we get to, to Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. Yeah, exactly. Um, Jackie says, and Steve say, as a symbol of authority, the ring. Yeah. Joseph went from prison to a position of authority. That's exactly where we go to in our life, from prison to a position of authority. It, it never tells us that we're going to be begging for bread, and in fact, or pleading to God or bargaining with God uh, to get something or to get there in our life. They never really had anything but a hopeful anticipation of God's favor. All the people that God blesses, like Joseph, they never had anything other than a hopeful anticipation of God's favor. I think we just simply try too hard to earn it. Read through some of these scriptures. You'll be amazed at Joseph's life. And then start calling upon the favor of God in your own life. Because God favors you. And he's blessing you. Quit trying so hard. Rest in Christ. Amen. Listen, you all have a great week. Be blessed in the Lord and, and have a great night. We will see you Friday night, 7 o'clock. We're going to have uh, communion and prayer. And then uh, we'll see you Sunday morning for Resurrection Sunday. Blessings, everybody.